Welcome back again, everyone, to another season of the Chinese Sayings Podcast. Laszlo Montgomery here with the season eight opener. And did I ever pick out a good one for you? You know, back in 1979, when I began studying Chinese, the teacher told us about these Sizi Chengyu, four character Chengyu, or idioms. Eh, how could I have known back then what she was talking about? She explained it like slang expressions that only had four characters. Well, it took one or two years of Chinese study before I started to learn more about these Chengyu phrases. And while most of them were four characters, some were five, six, or more characters, depending on the story. When I first got started with my self-study of these Chinese sayings, I did so with a book I purchased in Taipei, probably at Caves Books, during the summer of 1980. And I bought this book called Mei which means the word of the day. And the very first story in this book that I studied, character by character, is the Chengyu for today. Yi zi qian jin. And the story behind this saying is one of the most repeated tales from all of ancient Chinese history. And it comes to us straight from the records of the grand historian and concerns the story of Master Lu Bu Wei. And when you hear that name, it's a given that the story behind today's Chinese saying, Yi Zi Qian Jin, concerns the life of China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, or as he was known before then, Ying Zheng. Before we retell this great story from the chapter of the record of the grand historian called Liu Bu Wei Lie Chuan, the biography of Liu Bu Wei, let's first review the four characters behind Yi Zi Qian Jin. Yi means the number one, and a zi is a Chinese character. Qian means a thousand, and jin means gold. Real simple, this one is one character, a thousand gold. And for the backstory behind these four syllables that don't appear to mean anything, let's get right into the story. At the end of the Warring States period, in a relatively insignificant state called Wei, there lived a wealthy merchant named Lu Bu Wei, Now, this is the state of Wei in northeast Henan. That's usually spelled W-E-Y to differentiate it from the more consequential and way more powerful and much bigger state of Wei. Same sound, different Chinese character. Liu Bu Wei was a rich merchant who often went on business trips to Hantan, the capital of Zhao State. And on one of these trips, purely by happenstance, he made the acquaintance of a prince of Qin state named Ying Yi Ren. In the state of Qin, Yi Ren was not an important personage. His father, King Xiao Wen of Qin, had more than 20 children by various concubines, and Yi Ren was eh, somewhere in the middle of the order of succession. So his father had sent him to the state of Zhao as a political hostage. And Yi Ren's new friend, Lu Bu Wei, well, he was one heck of an ambitious man, and he wasn't satisfied with only being rich and successful. That wasn't enough for him. He was also hungry for power and working in the palace. And as soon as he met the acquaintance of the son of the king of Qin, well, he immediately saw an entree into politics in the form of Ying Yi Ren. Liu was thinking, if he could somehow get Yi Ren selected as the heir to the state of Qin, which was now one of the most powerful of the warring states, then he himself could ride on Yi Ren's coattails to power. So with this in mind, Liu Bu Wei began to make every effort to deepen his friendship with Yi Ren. First off, he made all his wealth available to the prince, and he even gave Yi Ren one of his own favorite concubines named Lady Zhao, or Zhao Qi. So by displaying all this extravagance and performing these favors... Lu Bu Wei soon became Yi Ren's most trusted and influential advisor. With Lu Bu Wei's sponsorship, encouragement, and adeptness at scheming, Yi Ren was indeed able to position himself as the heir to the Qin throne. And in November of the year 250 BC, indeed, Ying Yi Ren ascended the throne as King Zhuangxiang of Qin. Lu Bu Wei could hardly believe his good fortune. King Zhuangxiang named him his chief advisor and granted Liu rich lands around the city of Luoyang in Henan. But unfortunately for King Zhuangxiang, 
He wasn't able to enjoy being in the top spot for long. Barely three years after he ascended the throne, in 247 BC, he passed away. His 13-year-old son by Lady Zhao, Ying Zheng, was named the next king of Qin. Despite the loss of his ticket to ride, so to speak, Liu Bu Wei was able to turn this situation to his advantage as well. And he had Ying Zheng, who was after all only a 13-year-old boy, acknowledged him as his adoptive father and named him regent. Thus, the ultimate power of the Qin state now rested with Liu Bu Wei and his former concubine, Lady Zhao, Zhao Ji. Oh, and by the way, Liu Bu Wei, despite fixing Lady Zhao up with the late King Zhuangxiang, he never gave up his own intimate relationship with concubine Zhao. And in fact, the grand historian sort of intimates that Ying Zheng, well, his father may not have been King Zhuangxiang, if you uh, get what I mean. As regent, Liu Bu Wei realized that the other powerful states of the Warring States period, Zhao, Chu, Qi, and Wei, well, they each had famous scholars and great schools and were thus academically renowned and admired throughout the land. Liu Bu Wei was frustrated that Qin, although it had become a military powerhouse, it was still a relative nobody when it came to famous works of literature or schools of thought. All the great works and scholarly academies were all to the east of Qin. Thus, one of the first uses to which he put his great wealth and power as regent of Qin was to attract talent to Qin, offering them the best of treatment and the most comfortable ten years if they would only come to Xianyang, today the city of Xi'an. Many scholars found this offer irresistible, and soon Liu Bu Wei had more than 3,000 scholars under his name. These scholars came from diverse schools of thought and each had unique specialties, strengths, and viewpoints. As advisors, as well as sources of cultural prestige, they became an invaluable political resource for Liu Bu Wei. To, and to show off his new pool of scholars, Liu Bu Wei had them, according to each of their own strengths, write a series of more than 160 essays on the many events of the spring and autumn period that had preceded the Warring States period of the present times. And these essays ranged widely across disciplines, comprising essays on geology, astrology, geography, politics, history, and more. And what had been produced represented the greatest compendium of knowledge that was available to scholars in China at that time. In 239, these essays were all compiled into one great book that has survived down to our day, and it's called... Master Liu's Spring and Autumn Annals, the Liu Shi Chunqiu. Even back then, understandably, he was extremely proud of this book. He had the entire thing carved onto the largest bamboo strips available and posted all 100,000 or so characters onto the city gates of the Qin capital of Xianyang. Above it, he had someone hang a notice that said something to the effect that If a scholar from any part of China can improve this work by adding or deleting even a single character, I will reward them with a thousand liang of gold. Now, a liang is 50 grams, which is uh, 1.8 ounces to my fellow Americanskis scratching their heads. And then, as a further enticement, just like they do in Vegas, displaying a million bucks under guarded plexiglass, the thousand liang of gold was put on display beside the bamboo strips on which the book had been written. Add or delete a single character to improve this work. Who could do it? Well, don't forget the 3rd century B.C. times they lived in. No one, not a single scholar, dared to proffer any suggestions that would alter Master Liu's spring and autumn annals in any way. This was Admittedly, a great work, as all China literary scholars will agree today. And look at how many Cheng Yus the Liu Shi Chun Chou has yielded throughout the ages. A couple have made it to this educational program. This is, I think, the third one. The literary folk of Xianyang, and there were quite a few, 
They knew it was already a great work, but frankly speaking, no one dared challenge the likes of Chancellor Lu Bu Wei, whose backstory and egotism was well known to all. And now in our day, and I'm sure all throughout Chinese history, this Cheng Yu is good to use for any kind of literary work where you want to remark that the content, as written, was perfect. So masterfully written, not even the smallest edit was necessary. You could actually mean it if you feel that way, or it's a handy idiom to use when you, you just want to shoe shine your colleague or some literary figure, journalist that you meet, and look at what they wrote and say, oh man, this was just perfect. I wouldn't even change a word. So there you have it. Season 8 is off and running. Don't forget this Chinese Sayings podcast is also available in the China History podcast feed. I see most of you have been checking it out. Okay, let me send my thanks to Emma out in Beijing and Shanghai. She seems to go back home a lot. If it only took me four hours and 18 minutes, I'd go home all the time too. Thanks, Emma. And my great thanks to all of you, my wonderful CHP, CSP community all over the world. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles at the beginning of what's shaping up so far to be a hot town summer in the city. I welcome you to come back once more with feeling for another exciting episode of the Chinese Sayings Podcast.